Greenville was forced in the middle of a school year to totally desegregate. Uh, a good number of my friends just disappeared. <laughs> they were sent to another school. They made an announcement on the intercom. That was it. The first day, I think I'll never forget that. 542 teachers were transferred to other schools and approximately 12,000 pupils. I don't remember it with any kind of pain or anguish. We knew segregation was not better for the children. In 2020, black and white students in Greenville County share classrooms, books, buses, playgrounds, and cafeterias. Integration is all this generation knows. But not that many decades ago, they were separate. The groundwork laid by protests, sit-ins, arrests, and later a lawsuit filed in 1963 the case of Wittenberg versus Greenville County School District. The lawsuit was filed in the name of 11-year-old Elaine Wittenberg by her father, AJ, represented by attorney Willie Smith. This is his wife, Anna. We always thought Elaine was a little shy and that she wouldn't be able to stand the pressure, but she did great. The Wittenberg family was threatened, but persisted. A court victory in 1964 forced Greenville County Schools to adopt school choice and allow black students to attend white schools. You know, a lot of people say, well, how do you feel that you, your father uh, put you in this school? I said, no, he asked. He talked to me, my mother talked to me. I made a decision as best I could for a person that age, but it wasn't that I was thrust in anything. Elaine and five other African-American children were enrolled in Greenville Junior High. The first day, I think I'll never forget that, he drives up to the school. Well, go on and get out. I'll park the car. <laughs> and I see all these people all across the street, everywhere, the, the, the media. Freedom of choice governed the next five years. A small number of African-American families sent their children to white schools. What I remember was the debate that my parents and their friends had the summer before. Half of them thought it was a good idea and half of them thought it was a bad idea. That we might be mistreated, that we might be looked down upon in some way. Janice Mathis recalls the pressure she put on herself to succeed. I felt that my job was to show my teachers that I could learn anything that any other child could learn or anything they could teach. That's a lot for an 11 year old. In March of 1969, the school district was court ordered to begin planning for integration with a judge ordering desegregation by September of 1970. The district appealed, but in January of 1970, the court mandated immediate integration. The timetable shocked trustees the school district was given less than a month to design a plan acceptable to the court and to reorganize the school district according to the plan. School information, may I help you? It would take more than 3,000 volunteers answering phones, offering time and vehicles to move desks, books, and supplies, and forming committees to bolster community support for the district to reassign 12,000 students and more than 500 teachers. The population in Greenville County is approximately 80% white and 20% black. And using the ratio between whites and blacks, we assign pupils and teachers to schools. Of course, indirectly, every teacher and every pupil uh, was affected. I'm a Knox White, mayor of the city of Greenville, and in 1970, I was a new student, first time ever, at Greenville High School. I didn't know anyone when I went to Greenville High, and uh, I'd made a lot of friends early on, and I was working really hard to make friends, and then all of a sudden, um, after we came back from Christmas, a month or so later, uh, a good number of my friends just disappeared. <laughs> they were sent to another school, and uh, new faculty came in, so I had a teacher who 
disappeared and new teacher came in. So it was a time of tremendous adjustment. Of course, we knew what was going on in the larger community. She'd later become senior class president. Janice Mathis was a classmate of Mayor White. She'd been one of just a handful of black students before integration. But on February 17th, watched as hundreds of others were thrust into a new environment. What I remember about February was feeling very sorrowful. I had had four years to get used to what being in that setting was like. But for those kids who left their schools on a Friday, and I think school was closed that Monday, and they had to all come in to a new situation. Their colors were gone, their mascots were gone, their teams were gone. I lived in Nickeltown. So when Beck High School closed, those were my neighbors who were losing. It was practically a brand new school. 100 kids on the band. There was just a lot of sorrow. And then I felt like, as somebody who had a little bit more experience with it, that I had a responsibility to help make the transition easier for people that I knew from church and from Y-team groups and Girl Scouts to help make it a little bit easier for them. With integration came the closure of many black schools. The reassignment plan put grades one through five in white schools and sixth grade in black ones. Black high schools were either closed, became integrated junior high schools, or repurposed as career and special education centers. February of 1970, I was the teacher of special ed at uh, Beck High School. Well, the students didn't want to lose their heritage. Beck was a very successful high school, especially athletically, and we had an outstanding faculty there. Uh, we had some people on that faculty that were movers and shakers and kids benefited from this. So they weren't in such a hurry to lose what they had simply for the good that it could and did provide. On Friday, February 13th, schools closed at 1 p.m. to begin the move. They made an announcement on the intercom. That was it. And then... Uh, I think uh, went home and it was all over the news. Young Clyde Mays. <laughs> Clyde Mays was in his junior year at Beck High School, a star basketball player with a state championship in the middle of an undefeated season. It was a shock, a real shock to all. They came and told us that, you know, I was preparing to go to practice. They said, no, school's closing. You're going to Wayhampton High School. Your sister's going to J.L. Mann High School. So it was a disappointment, a little anger came in because we was in the midst of another great year, probably would have won the championship at Joe's B. Beck High School again. His team divided. Most classmates assigned to jail man. Mays was bused from his Nickeltown home to Wade Hampton. The people that they picked up in my community and surrounding areas, we got off the bus and we was directed to where to go and everything and everybody was doing this and doing that. There's plenty of pictures. They had assembly in the, um, in the assembly hall and they, uh, they told us the procedures, what we had to do. We had to meet counselors and figure out the classes and stuff like that. In reality, it was separate but it sure wasn't equal. Anna Smith, wife of the civil rights attorney, herself a psychology teacher with a master's degree, transferred from Sterling High to Wade Hampton. I was so surprised when I went to Wade Hampton High School to see the things that they had that I did not have when I was at Sterling. Just uh, to even show a film in my classroom. During the transition, Community leaders of both races were called upon to build support and promote peace. My dad, Jack Powers, served on the committee. He was a human resource professional at CRIVAC, which was a major employer in Simpsonville, South Carolina. And their workforce had already been integrated and he was actively involved in recruiting minority employees. Lynn Gibbs was in eighth grade at Hillcrest Middle in 1970. Her dad stood with his African-American colleagues outside Simpsonville schools on February 17th. So many people weren't exposed to each other. And I think what they wanted to do is have this group of volunteers who were comfortable with each other that were standing side by side at a school to present unity. So you would have an African-American person in the community and a white person greeting students. The more the school board can get people involved 
in the transition and get them actively doing something and working towards it, the more people they're going to have supporting it. Advertising campaigns ran on television and in local newspapers to bolster support. These efforts, the remark made by a black student picked up as the slogan of a full-fledged advertising campaign, the important thing is education. But perhaps the greatest of unifiers was teamwork, sports. Athletics does something to people where they, they leave all the other stuff out there and they just come together as a team. Ken Peek was the first African-American to coach football at J.L. Mann High School. My players and I, uh, I mean, we bonded right away. He remembers being asked during his interview if he'd have trouble working with students of different races. And of course, my answer to him, I remember just like it was yesterday, it was Dr. Seifert. I deal with kids. Uh, I don't deal with color. I don't get into the ethnic ethnicity kind of thing. I say, it doesn't matter to me. The most important thing to me is that I make a difference in the lives of the children that I'm responsible for. In 1970, I was teaching and coaching at Greer High School. Pat Suttis, now a trustee on Greenville County's school board, remembers the clear direction faculty was given at Greer High before the integration on how to welcome new students and encourage tolerance. We had several students that had come into our, into our campus. Not only did they help the athletic program, they helped the understanding between the two group, different groups of people, how they can get along together. Even though we were different, we still managed to get along with one another. And I've always been proud of that fact, that in Greer we've always had a camaraderie between all people in our community. When you're from Greer, you're from Greer. There were about 300 that, that switched schools. And we had tense times, but we worked through it. Coach Jim Mattis recalls an assembly for the 300 new students at Berea High School on February 17th. This gymnasium is actually named after this gym. It was in the gymnasium that now bears his name. Mattis coached varsity basketball and track his rules and expectations were clear to all of his athletes. And they knew the rules. And if they broke the rules, they paid the price. And you know, it's, it's one and the other. It's, it's not segregated. We're not gonna do this for one and not do that for the other. Putting two groups together, you know, it's, uh, they, they're apprehensive. And finally, the apprehension went away and they were buddies. Across the district, the transition was not without unrest, protests, and walkouts. I was part of a walkout at school. That I had friends who got expelled for walking out in protest. I was exposed over the next couple of years to some unrest where we had the National Guard at the gates to the school. And there were um, officers brought in. I think these officers are from SLED. Jan Helton was a sophomore at Parker High School when rioting began there. There was uh, a riot which we did not see because we were in class and they would just locked us in our classrooms and told us to stay. And uh, we stayed for a long time and finally uh, I was on a first floor classroom and we climbed out the windows and to get to our cars we had to walk right by where the people were had congregated on the steps of the auditorium. It was a little tense, a little scary walking by, not looking at anybody, just trying to get to the car. Some schools closed for a couple of days for a cooling down. Biracial student committees were tasked with finding common ground. The district added black studies to its curriculum. There were some outstanding teachers there at that time. It was a woman named Joyce Green who taught history and she recognized that we needed more about Africa and African Americans. She took a summer and created a textbook for us out of magazine articles and news clippings. Kids will get along. If, you, if, we, if we stay out of their way and out of their conversations and let them do what kids do, kids will make it. 50 years later, we aren't all the way there. Yeah, it's an ongoing process. You know, you can change locations. 
You can change laws, uh, but you can't change people's hearts. That has to be changed from within. There has been progress. Every person we interviewed marveled at the diversity and the camaraderie among races within today's student body. It wasn't like this, no. And the people impacted by integration had successes and opportunities they might not have had otherwise. Clyde Mays won two state titles at Wade Hampton High School. He went on to play at Furman and then the pros. We were happy, all the teammates were happy. It was something that had never been done at Wade Hampton. Knox White, who lost all those friends he'd found and was forced to make new ones, used those social skills to become student body president his senior year and is now in his 25th year as mayor of Greenville. But looking back at it years later in particular, I really greatly respect the fact that we had a good student leadership and a good attitude with the student body as a whole because there was a welcoming attitude. People really sent the word out, you know, be cool and just um, take, these, take these changes. And, uh, and that's a good thing. And the pioneer, Elaine Wittenberg, who had the courage to be the first black student to attend a white school in Greenville. It, it's, it's so different now. And I, I said, this is just wonderful. Now spends her Mondays volunteering at A.J. Wittenberg Elementary, a school named for her father. Humble in her role as a history maker. I don't look at myself as the only one or, oh, I've, I've done something great or wonderful, but I think I've played a part in um, improving and evolving. We got off to a really good start, and that will always be an important part of the story. It's a joy because, you know, who would have thought core order integration would have this much success? There's a piece of history in so many people. People are supposed to be treated right, and you need people to stand up and look out for those that don't speak up for themselves.